Hello and welcome to Cosmi Cosmic Mysteries, where we will briefly explain how astronomy and astrology differ. We will get into some information about stuff in space and explore the benefits of a planetarium. Get ready to visit the stars and beyond. I'm your host, Hannah Tattenden, and with me today is my co-host, Brian C. Slack, who just so happens to be a planetarium educator. My, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me. Can you tell me a bit about yourself and your position at the Horwitz Deremer Planetarium? Well, as you mentioned, I'm an astronomy educator there. Um, I teach uh, stargazing, general astronomy, and I do a lot of tech work behind the scenes. Oh, wow. That sounds like an interesting job. So later, I do have some questions for you, and we can talk a little bit, but we will also be testing each other with some trivia questions. But first, let's see a little bit about how astrology and astronomy are different from each other. So astrology is the study of the stars with the intent of predicting the futures in our lives. Um, and it comes from a long history of weaving stories about the stars and trying to connect to them. Astrologers interpret uh, objects based on their patterns and uh, specifically the sun and the moon and the planets uh, appear to change position with respect to the stars on a regular basis. Um, and astrologers infer meaning in our lives based on those changes in the apparent positions of the sun and the planets. It is appealing to feel like you can know the future in some way. Um, so, uh, based on the past, right? And that's, in a, in a very vague sense, that's what astrology is, is trying to do. Uh, it's just the information that it's using to do that doesn't actually connect to the things that it claims to. So like astrological horoscopes say, you know, kind of vague things about what you might expect because you were born, you know, during this time period. But actually, it really means time of the year, right? Because if you're a Taurus, you're a Taurus no matter what year you were born in. Um, but there's so many other things in your life that affect what happens to your life that we do definitely know, like, you know, like the genes that you get from your parents and the environment that you live in and, and, and the choices you make given that environment. Often people confuse the two terms, astronomy and astrology. And let me just point out that it makes sense that people get confused because some things, a lot of scientists like biology end in logy. So you might confuse the two. But in astronomy, uh, when we're talking about studying how the universe works, that is astronomy. So that is stars and law. How does it work, right? I think the first thing that an astronomer has to do is decide what is a question that's interesting. There's a lot of universe to study. So after you decide, okay, this is a question that I'm curious about, I'd like to get into more, then you figure out what data do you need to answer that question. And really, most of the data that we have is light, right? That's all we get. There are a few exceptions, but really, most of what we get is light from stars. And we've gotten very clever in the last couple hundred years, squeezing that light for all it's worth and extract as much information from it as we can, like how hot a star is or how bright it is how far it is, uh, what's it made of, like there's a lot of stuff we can tell about a star. I gotta say, a few years ago, I would not have known the difference, so learning about their distinctions may really help others. 
So Brian, uh, how about we start with some of these trivia questions and get those astronomical gears turning? Sounds cool. Hey, let me start first, all right? All right. Okay. The NASA space shuttle was the first reusable spacecraft. True or false? Uh, I'm gonna go with true. That's right. Nice. All right, here's a stumper for you. What was the name of the first artificial satellite in space? Ooh. I'll even give you some amp options here. We've got Galileo, Cassini, Mariner 9, or Sputnik 1. Sputnik 1, of course. There you go. The Hubble telescope orbits the Earth and is powered by A, rocket fuel, B, solar energy, C, nuclear energy, D, all of the above. You know, I'm gonna go with solar energy. Hey, you got it. Nice. All right, here's a true or false. Astronauts cannot burp in space. Ooh, that's a good question. But I think they can. Actually, yeah, you do need gravity to burp. Is so that that's right? one bodily function they cannot do. But oh. um, how about this? Are you able to burp at the planetarium? Yeah, we do once in a while. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> true or false, the sun is a planet. The sun is a star, not a planet. That is correct. Perfect. All right, Brian, what is the largest manned object ever sent into space? Oh boy, largest manned object ever sent into space. At one time? Yeah, I'll give you a hint. It's bigger than a football field. Oh, I would say that's the ISS. Absolutely, the okay. International Space Station. All right. Uh, what planet is known for having rings around it? Well, what is known for having rings around it, that's Saturn. That's correct. But I think there are some others. I know Jupiter has rings. Are there any other planets Jupiter, that have? Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune all have rings. Awesome. All of them also. Oh, my favorite is Neptune. How long does it take for light to travel from the sun to the Earth? Is it that one second, 30 minutes and five seconds? Eight minutes and 20 seconds, or about an hour? Eight minutes and 20 seconds. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What's the coldest place in the universe? The Boomerang Nebula, the North Pole, Venus, or Iceland? Well, Wisconsin was not one of those things that you mentioned. I'm gonna have to go with the Boomerang Nebula. You are correct. That was a very tough one, too. I'm you doing know, pretty good here. We might have a spot for you at the planetarium. Oh, I'd love that. Well, what about this? What was the very first food ever eaten in space? Was it meat, ice cream, pizza, or grapes? Oh boy. I'm gonna go with ice cream. It was, I mean, that's a good guess because it did come in a toothpaste tube, but it was actually meat. Oh, okay. You know, I think we have some of that at the planetarium. Oh yeah. <laughs> True or false, we can only see one side of the moon from Earth. That's true. That is correct, too. Awesome. All right, how about this? Who was the first astronaut in space? Was that Alan Shepard, Yuri Gagarin, Neil Armstrong, or Mae Jemison? That would be Yuri Gagarin. The mm -hmm. Russians beat us on that one. What is a meteor called when it hits the Earth? I think that's a meteorite. That is correct. <laughs> My third grade teacher, Mrs. Sullivan, would be proud. Shout out to Mrs. Sullivan. What year did astronauts first land on the moon? It would be 1969. Absolutely. What was the name of the first dog in space? Oh boy, it's probably not my dog's name, which is Lucky. You're gonna have to tell me. Well, I'll give you a choice. Lassie, Laika, Pluto, or Petey? I think it is Laika, I've heard that before. You are correct. Awesome. All right, which planet is known for its great red spot? Ah, that would be Jupiter. And it's out in the sky tonight if you go out and look. Oh, amazing. I'll have to catch up with Jupiter later. Mm -hmm. True or false, we have spent, yeah, we have sent spacecraft to Mars. I'm gonna say we have sent spacecraft, but not space people. That is correct. We have littered the surface of Mars with tons of space junk, <laughs> space Instruments yes, and yeah. You bet. Awesome. Well, what is the hottest planet in our solar system? I would go with Venus. That's correct. Mm -hmm. It says Venus is actually, uh, the temperature of Venus can be higher than 850 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, okay. You can bake a pizza real quick. You could. Well, I'm really enjoying all this and finding these topics super interesting. Uh, it's very intriguing, even if I don't know all the answers, but Speaking of interesting, let's take a moment to see how someone can become 
more familiar with the sky and why there hasn't been anyone else sent to the moon. Let's have a look. Starting with let's look up, right? The, the more people look up, the more familiar they can become. Uh, the fact is that we live, many of us live in cities, which means that it's a little harder. But starting in the city is good because there's fewer, fewer things to look for. Um, but if you get familiar with enough to say, okay, I recognize, say, Orion, I recognize the Big Dipper, you can also acquaint yourself with the sky by looking at apps. There are apps that you can look up and say, okay, what am I looking at? And they'll tell you, oh, that's Jupiter. Oh, okay. Um, but then the next step would be to go to a darker sky where there's many more things to look for. To get to the moon, you have to spend a lot of energy. It's not just like, you know, you just shoot something up and it's there. You have to shoot something up and then you have to change which way it's going and send it towards the moon. And then presumably they want to come back, right? So you have to, you have to be able to orbit the moon, land on the moon, and then shoot up from the moon, orbit the moon, and then come back to Earth. So it's, it's tricky and it's expensive and it's very dangerous because, you know, there's no, there's no air to breathe after once you leave the Earth's atmosphere. So you got to take it all with you and not lose anything. Um, and, uh, and yeah, if, you, if anything breaks, no one's there to help you. You can't just go to the repair shop. So that's why they haven't sent more people to the moon. I mean, it's expensive uh, and it's dangerous and hard. Now, there is a program to do it. They're trying to do it uh, within the next few years, so we'll see. But I'm not going there until there are cruise ships that go regularly. Then I will, I'll take a cruise to the moon once, once that's happening and safe. I guess it would be useful to say like, why I do what I do, like what's my motivation, right? And for me, I, I think I get a great sense of satisfaction out of feeling like I know where I am in the universe. Um, and it's very um, awe-inspiring to, to look at an object in the telescope and see what it, the light that's reaching my eye and think that that is light that has traveled you know, thousands or even millions of light years to reach my eye and thinking also about the fact that that is a glimpse into the past, like the distant past. You know, I can't see the dinosaurs roaming on the earth anymore, right? But I can look in the telescope and I can see something that emitted light at the same time the dinosaurs were on the earth. I, for one, can't wait until there's another moon mission. So Brian, I'd really like to understand your love for astronomy and where that started, and also what inspired you to have a job in this field? Well, when I was very young, I enjoyed going out and looking at the stars and seeing the shooting stars in the night sky. But the real turning point was when I was in the sixth grade at Walter Allen grade school. We used to get this little flyer in the paper, or a little flyer called My Weekly Reader, and it had news stories in it. And it had this grainy picture of the planet Saturn taken by, at then, large, largest telescope in the world, the Hale Telescope. Mm -hmm. And my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Taylor, said, oh, I can see that in my telescope at home a lot better than this picture is. And then being a wise guy, sitting in the front row, I, I kind of made a comment that resulted in a phone call to my parents. Oh, I'm sure. And the next night, we were in his backyard looking through his telescope at the planet Saturn, and he was right. It looked clear and crisp and colorful. It was quite a sight to see, and ever since then, I've been hooked in the field of astronomy. Wow, that's amazing. A lifelong interest. Mm -hmm. Well, why do you think it's important for people to become more familiar with astronomy? Um, astronomy is a, a curiosity science, and, and it's man's hunger to, to learn and explore and, and gain knowledge and gain facts and data. So I think it's a, a great satisfying thing for people, and uh, it, it teaches people on just how to learn and, and, and find their place in, in this universe, in this creation. Wow. 
Well, speaking of curiosity, I'm curious to know, do you have a favorite constellation and has it always been that or changed over time? I've always been uh, living under the sign of Orion, I guess you wow. could say. Orion is my, my favorite constellation, the hunter with his three stars in a row, two above, two below, his name starts with an O, that's Orion the constellation. Well, that's awesome. Um, can you explain to me how comets and shooting stars are different? Uh, shooting stars are, are pretty much uh, uh, rocky or metallic objects that, that enter the Earth's atmosphere. They're, they're floating around, they're remnants. They're, they're both remnants of, of the, uh, the creation of the solar system when, when the nebulous gas condensed and, mm -hmm. and created the planets and things. Comets are, are more icy. They tend to uh, live in an area around our solar system called the Art Oort Cloud, which is beyond Pluto. So much farther away than much a shooting star. Much farther away, yeah. And, and shooting stars uh, actually come close to Earth and are around Earth, and they enter the Earth's atmosphere. That's a shooting star. It burns up. Whereas uh, a comet will, will circle the sun and get close to the sun, and as it starts to melt, its gases start to glow by this, this, the light and, and the radiation, and that's what we see in the sky is a comet. So Wow, that's fascinating. Me meteors burn up in the atmosphere. Comets glow in the sky. Yep. They go around the sun. Well, in your opinion, what is the most fascinating thing in the night sky or space in general? What captivates your interest? Oh boy, that's a tough question. There's so many things up there, but I like to, to do what's called deep sky observing, looking at things beyond our solar system, sometimes mm -hmm. beyond our galaxy, uh, nebula, star clusters, and, and other galaxies far, far away. So those are the things that kind of catch me on a, on a dark, clear night. Yeah, the great mystery out of it all. Mm -hmm. Well, it has been great hearing about your love for astronomy, but now I want to touch base on planetariums. Uh -huh. Whether it's a showing or an event, they are such a great way to learn or explore various astronomy topics. Whether you're bored and want something to do for fun or just want to become more familiar with certain topics, the experiences at a planetarium can be extremely captivating and informational. Let's see if we can get a glimpse of it. My name is Sarah Parker. I am a planetarium educator here at the Horwitz Dreamer Planetarium, and my role is giving shows and outreach events to uh, people in the Waukesha community, as well as developing some visuals for inside the planetarium dome. I think the planetarium is a really exciting place that is different from your average classroom. So kids get to come here on school field trips and they get to see this awesome lobby and you know different um, ways to interact you know in a tactile and visual and auditory manner um, that they don't necessarily always get in a classroom. So when the kids get to come here they get this different experience of being immersed with astronomy as opposed to when they are in the classroom setting. So we have a few interactive displays. One is our gravity maze. So what it is is two projectors that sort of create this um, fabric of space-time and as you stand underneath it um, you can see that fabric of space-time warp around you and different stars and objects that will actually orbit you or their path will be changed by the gravity of your body. Um, another interactive display we have here is the aurora wall and similarly you can um, stand up to the wall and take your hand and wave it around and you can actually move the aurora within the display. Um, we also have a zodiac zone which you get to explore all of the different zodiac constellations including um, an extra little secret 13th one that not many people know about named Ophiuchus and you get to push the buttons and explore um, which zodiac sign is your own. My favorite part about working at the planetarium is when the kids come in to see your show and you really get to engage them and um, 
just when you see their reactions when you show them something cool. For instance, when you turn off all the lights in the dome and you show the light pollution and then you show it without the light pollution and all the oohs and ahs that you get as soon as you can see all of the stars in the Milky Way. That, that hands down is my favorite thing. I love simply looking up at the night sky, but I really love the feel and vibe of a show and the amazing things they can show you. If you've never been to one, you should really consider it. Now, Brian, what would you say is your favorite part of working at the planetarium? My favorite part of working there is when I get a chance to do a star talk with a, a audience full of people in an, under the dome. We like to take them through a nice mood setting sunset to uh, to set the tone and get the crickets chirping in the background and everything with some nice spacey music playing in the background. And then we start to take a walk through the sky and point all the different stars and constellations. I try to teach it in such a way that once the session is done, when these people go out at night and look up in a night, night sky, they can remember or start talking and say, oh yes, I remember that constellation. I know that star. Oh look, there's a planet that he talked about in the sky. And that's what I try to create under my star talk. So they'll learn about our star and then also some of its neighbors. That is correct. Wonderful. Um, is there anything interesting happening right now at the planetarium that people should come see or um, any recent improvements? Um, actually, we're getting pretty excited at the planetarium right now because the eclipse is coming in April. On April 8th, we're going to experience a total eclipse in a part of the country in the Milwaukee area here itself. We're going to get about a 90% eclipse coverage of, this, of the sun by the moon. And so we're, we're kind of focusing on that. But we do have a lot of programs going on every Saturday. People can come out. We have a, an early show at 11 o'clock geared mostly for a younger audience. And then we've got the mind-blowing science programs in the afternoon. And we're also going to be having shows on Wednesdays, Wednesday nights, I believe. We're mm -hmm. going to be offering shows at another time slot and we're just preparing for summer. In the summer, we're going to have laser light program out oh, at wow. the planetarium, and I think that's going to coincide when the uh, visiting beer garden is going to be at the Retzer Nature Center. So you'll get a chance to take in both of those things. Special effects almost as cool as the real deal, hey? Yeah, it's actually, actually it's all tied in with rock and roll music. And your, oh, very cool. Pick your favorite band, Pink Floyd, or something like that. And we'll probably have an evening where we're doing music and lasers with that. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I'd like to backtrack a little bit. You said that we have an uh, eclipse approaching. Can you tell me a little bit more about what celestial bodies are blocking what and what we call that? Oh, well, sure. A, a solar eclipse is when the moon comes between the sun and the earth mm -hmm. and casts its shadow on the earth. And as that shadow works its way across the earth, if you happen to be in the path where that shadow lies, you'll see the sun completely disappear. The, the sky around you will, will look uh, like just after sunset or just before dawn, but you'll see this big black hole in the sky where mm -hmm. the sun used to be. And this is the only time you can ever really look up at, at the direction of the sun safely is when it's under a total eclipse because the sun is completely blocked out. Wisconsin, and Milwaukee in particular, is just a little bit off of that path. So the sun's not going to be completely covered up. It'll be about 90%. Wow. But there's still enough sun poking through that, 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 uh, that coverage there that could damage your eyes. So if you want to so see it, you need protection. It. You need protection. And you have to have either special glasses or use a special telescope with filters on it. Or you have to use a method called projection where you can project an image on something and look at that projected image. But mm -hmm. never look directly at the sun without some sort of protection. And we do offer those glasses at the planetarium. If you come to a show, we can give you a pair of those glasses. I'll have to stop by before our April eclipse. Mm -hmm. Speaking of sunsets and other dazzling displays, I have another trivia question for you. Because uh -oh. I'm still trying <laughs> to stump you. Oh. What color is a sunset on Mars? What color is a sunset on Mars? Boy, I've never been there. <laughs> Let me think. Hmm. Well, because we have a blue atmosphere, that in, it affects the color of the sun here. The sun is really a white star, but because it comes through our blue atmosphere, it appears to us as yellow. So I'm guessing since there's a carbon dioxide sunset on Mars and its the atmosphere is very thin, 
I would guess it probably still says kind of a yellow or a light pinkish or something like that. Well, you were pretty close. It actually, when you started out, it's blue on Mars as well. Is that right? Uh -huh. Maybe Man. one day we'll be able to go uh, and check it out ourselves. Boy. Yeah. Well, that's great. And frankly, what a cosmic adventure we have had. But now, sadly, our show is coming to an end. But before we leave, is there anything you'd like to say to the young kids aspiring to study astronomy or simply anyone looking to become more involved? Well, the, the universe is endless, and there's just so much there that you can study. You can study the stars, you can study the planets, you can study other galaxies. It, it's just a, a burgeoning science field for you to explore. And, and you can do it all from your backyard if you want to. And even nowadays, you have access to big telescopes that you couldn't normally afford to have on your own. And you can go through the internet and access these telescopes and do your own observing through larger telescopes sponsored by other people. Wow. So it's a field that's wide open for anyone who's interested, right? That is correct. Well, thank you so much, Brian, for joining us today and being a part of our show. Mm -hmm. And although science is able to shed light on some things for us, there's a lot of stuff that we don't know and may never understand about space. But one thing is for sure, discovery will never stop and we will never quit learning about what's up there. I hope to catch you all again, but that's it for today's episode of Cosmic Mysteries. Until next time, always stay curious and keep your eyes on the night sky.